let's talk about coroutines. Uh, so coroutines are an interesting feature of Pico 8. They essentially let you split functionality over multiple frames. For example, let's set up some functions here. A basic uh, init, update, and draw. We will clear the screen and then we will draw a rectangle and uh, let's define an X and Y for this. So X equals 32, Y equals 64. That's not how you do that. And then we'll say X plus eight, Y plus eight, and we'll draw that as a white rectangle. Okay, so then let's say over time, we wanted to move this rectangle. We might have an animation timer. And we'll say, timer equals 30. I'll we'll say if timer is greater than zero, then timer minus equals one, x plus equals one. So now our little rectangle will move 30 pixels to the right as our timer counts down. So another way we could do that with a coroutine is to create uh, we will say our routine r equals co-create function. And in that function, in a loop, we'll say i equals zero to 30, do x plus equals one. And then in our update, we will resume that coroutine, which is saying co-resume r. Uh, the magic of a coroutine is actually you need to yield each step of the way. So when you call yield, you're yielding control back to the main thread. So coresume will resume our coroutine. It will iterate on this loop and do one, one step of the loop and yield back to the main thread, complete that frame and continue. So we don't need this timer anymore. And now it'll do the same thing that we were just seeing over 30 frames. So it's doing the same thing, but it's roughly the same amount of code, but we could start to build an animation library around this. So uh, the coroutines, I like to set up an async function for one. I just call it async. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, that takes a function and that will um, add to a collection. So we'll define this in a sec, but we'll do um, call it routines. So it will co-create a routine and it will add that to a routines table which we need to define up here so now we can have as many routines as we want so now instead of that uh, we will so we'll do that differently in a sec we want to call async on this now async function. So we define an anonymous function that has our logic here. We no longer have a variable defined as R, but we can iterate over all our routines. So for R in all routines, do resume. Now we have the same thing working, but we could potentially have many different routines that all get created with this async call. So I could say, async function uh, for i equals 0, 30, do y minus equals 1. Actually, we'll change the value there. We'll do 2, and we'll yield. So now we move up a bit and to the right a bit. That's obviously more code than we would probably want to write for a simple animation. So we can start to build a few more helpers here. Uh, let's put these on an object. So we'll say player equals empty object, player.x equals that, player.y equals that. Uh, let's just make sure this still works if we change these. Uh, there's no more x, so we need player.x, player.y, player.x, player.y. Okay, so those still work. 
And then we want to get rid of this duplication. So how can we do that? Uh, we can make maybe an animation function. It's called animate and it takes an object and um, maybe a key and a value to move to and a number of frames, let's call it F. And then it needs to do the same thing that we were doing up here. So this should, oops, a little too far. Uh, now we have number of frames, the I equals one to the number of frames. Take the objects key and we want to step it towards the value. So the objects key will actually be uh, equal to a simple linear interpolation function. Um, linear interpolation or lerping takes the from value, the to value, and a percentage of time. Uh, so then we can say we want to return the from value plus the to value minus the from value, so the difference times the time. A lot of times you'll see this simplified, so this might just be a, b, t, and so we want to say a plus b minus a times t. So that's essentially going to say get the difference between the start value and the end value and multiply it times a percentage of the uh, animation's completeness. So we want to lerp from uh, the initial value, so we need to get that here. Call that init equals object k, so the key on the object. And then we want to lerp from the initial value to the defined value. And we need a percentage of time here. So the percentage of time is i divided by the number of frames. Uh, yeah. So we're not calling animate yet, but we should now be able to replace some of these functions up here. So now let's say animate player, uh, we want to put the key as a string to 96. Let's get rid of the second call and see if that works. Uh, we missed something, missed the closing paren, and it's doing nothing. Why are we doing nothing? animate object key value. Oh, we didn't pass in frames. So usually I give frames a default value. So I can say F equals F or 30. Still not doing anything. Why not? Animate. So lerp should be returning a value. We're lerping from the initial value to the defined value. Oh, init is not an object. That's different from how I normally do these sorts of things. Something that would have helped me catch that is actually calling uh, assert around my coroutine resume. So coroutines will silently fail. That's one thing that's a, it's a bit of a gotcha. If I assert on the coroutine, and let me uh, re-implement this bug. Yeah, so now I'll get an error. Uh, attempt to index local init. So init is not an object and I attempted to call a key on it. Um, that is definitely a gotcha with coroutines. They can silently fail and so we assert around them to make sure that we get that value back. There's actually another bug that we may run into here so let's do that. So now the coroutine runs and we get this error. Um, Corolib cannot resume dead coroutine. So now that we are asserting, we're actually catching another error where we're trying to resume a dead coroutine. So coroutines can be in a few different states. They can be running, suspended, or dead, and we actually only want to resume them if they're not dead. So if uh, co-status is the function we use to figure out the status of a coroutine, if co-status of R is equal to dead, then we want to remove that. We're done with that coroutine. So we'll delete from routines R, else we will assert the run. So now it should run without error. So now it's going to animate, that coroutine's going to end, and then it's going to uh, dump that coroutine. So if I print 
the length of routines. Question mark is shorthand for print, by the way. Uh, pound gets you the count or the length of a table. So we have one routine for the duration of that animation, and then when the routine ends, it gets dropped from the routines table. So now we can go up here and we can add uh, another concurrent routine. So we can say animate the Y value to, let's say 64. Why did that not work? It takes the time, but we don't, oh, it is 64. That's why it's not going anywhere. So now we're saying for one second, sit still. So let's change that to 32. So these won't happen concurrently, they'll happen separately because uh, these are gonna go in series in one asynchronous function. If we wanted that to run differently, we could have the animate library set up separate coroutines. So we could have animate actually be the one that calls async. And so now, uh, do we need all of that to happen in there? Not technically, I think this could happen out here. And so now, Animate will actually set up the asynchronous call itself. So there's two routines running concurrently, animating in two different directions. And we could continue to adjust that Animate function and make it take multiple properties or any way we want to do that. Um, another thing we might want to do though, let's, let's actually put this back. Didn't go back far enough. Async 32, okay. Right, so now this is happening in series. So let's say I wanted this to wait. Well, one way to do that would be we add 4i equals 1 to 30, do end. Uh, and we say yield. So for 30 frames, just do nothing. So we're gonna sit there for a second and then we're gonna do the second animation. But I use that frequently enough that I like to create a helper for it so that I can just say wait 30. And so let's go down to where we defined our animation logic. We'll just put it down here. Function wait frames for i, oops, i equals one to f do yield. So now, uh, let's say, let's animate the player to 64, wait 10 frames, not that long. Then animate the player to 96, and then we'll move up. Uh, we'll wait one more time there. So then let's take a longer pause. We'll do a full 30 frames there. So now animate the player's X to 64, wait 10 frames, animate the player's X to 96, wait 30 frames, and then animate the Y value up. So we're gonna move halfway, wait a brief second, wait a full second there, move up. So we can start to build a series of steps here and you can imagine how you might use this for a cutscene or dialogue or anything else where you want to distribute functionality over time. Uh, one way we can make this a little bit more interesting is to start introducing animation curves. So here we are uh, just taking the, the straight percentage, the current frame divided by the total number of frames. And so that's pretty linear. Uh, <clears throat> if instead, uh, let's just say local E equals, um, let's define this somewhere else, function linear, that's gonna take a percentage of time and it's just gonna return itself. So by default, E equals linear, and then we can just call it E with the percentage here. Um, I intended to add an argument. So actually instead of local, say E equals E or linear. Uh, where do we mess up? Oops, not an extra equals. E equals E or linear. So by default, we're gonna have linear animation. It's gonna move um, a small percentage each step in a linear motion. There are some really cool animation curves on a website by Valor ADHD that I will link to down below, but I'm gonna jump over to that page real quick 
and grab one of those animation curves. And we will do, um, not sure how well this is gonna work. I'm gonna grab an elastic function here. So ease in elastic. I haven't tried this out. Let's see how it looks. So I'll just change the default here, but now we could pass it in as an argument. Actually, no, let's, let's demonstrate that. So the default is linear, but we could go up here and say, um, we haven't defined number of frames. So we'll do a linear animation. Then over 30 frames, we will do an ease in elastic animation. So we go linear, and then we do an ease in elastic, and then we move straight. So it's pretty easy to start adding different things. Uh, I'll do another one just as a test. These are even more complex. I'm gonna grab a, a bouncing animation. And so let's do ease out bounce. Uh, maybe we'll just change the first one here. So let's say this very first one is actually gonna take 90 frames, so three seconds with an ease out bounce. I don't really like how that looks. Let's see what, what's happened if we make this shorter. Yeah, it kind of bounces into position, then moves, and then a very linear motion. So you can start to imagine how you might animate your characters with different animation curves. And then the next thing you're gonna run into, I won't get into how to solve this in this video, maybe I'll do another video on this. If you start building up an animation with all of these animation calls, you're going to start using a lot of tokens. So in this case, just copy and pasting this a few times is 75 tokens. What you may wanna do next is start to define animations using strings. So maybe we have an animations table and we make an intro animation and then that uses a multi-line string to say, call the animate function with the player object, uh, the key of X, the value of 96, et cetera, et cetera. So now you start doing that a whole bunch of times and you've got just one token here for this multi-line string. So once you start building up the helpers, calling the coroutines, you, you kind of build the functionality and the structure. You want to separate your data from the logic that is actually going to be using those coroutines to create animations. So that's just a brief overview. Uh, that's, that's one way that I use coroutines to create animation systems in the games that I work on. If you have any uh, thoughts or questions, or if you think I did anything wrong here, please let me know, and I'd be happy to make another video on these. And uh, maybe the next one we'll be talking about how to split up a string like this and save yourself some tokens. Thanks for watching. See ya.